for joining the um, uh, joining the uh, and the Air Community Webinar Series, an uh, outgrowth of the successful Iris Up Plus uh, Webinar Series, and we'll get started with our uh, senior speaker, as we call them, uh, David Gefeller from the Computational Cancer Biology Lab at University of Lausanne. He's going to speak to us about contemplating MHC peptidomes to better predict them. And we'll give um, David the uh, screen. Good, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> Hopefully, you can see my slides. Yep. Presume yes. Okay. So thanks a lot for this for this nice invitation. I'm very happy to to present some of our work in this audience, and I hope uh, it will also trigger your interest, even if we're gonna speak a bit more about MHC than TCR, but I have some small vignette at the last part that will be focused on, on TCRs. Um, but basically as, as an introduction, we've, we've seen over the last 10 years, uh, my brilliant success of cancer immunotherapy in, in cancer patients with drugs that were proved and led to, to long-term survival of several patients. And this, from this we can conclude that something specifically displayed on the surface of cancer cells can be seen by T cells and can even be exploited to mediate uh, T cell recognition and, and elimination of, of cancer cells. And this has, of course, uh, many um, clinical application in, in vaccine design, in adaptive T cell transfer. We'll not go too much too deep into this, but I think it's, it's important to, to, to mention this. Um, and also to put everybody on stage, uh, when uh, we mean that something is recognized by T cells, the, the decades of knowledge in immunology have taught us how this, this process works. And this has to do with antigen presentation on the so-called HLA or MHC uh, genes. So internal protein segments coming from the proteasome degradation get taken up by the antigen presentation pathway and then can be displayed on the cell surface by MHC molecule. So I'm showing you the, the picture for MHC class one. There is also MHC class two, which we'll be discussing in this, in this talk, which the, the presentation pathway is slightly different, but I'm not entering into, into necessarily all these details for, for the sake of simplicity. Now, upon presentation of something different from self, and in the field of cancer, of course, this can be a mutated protein, for instance, that uh, leads to, to peptides that contain these mutations, but it could be also a viral epitope for, from a viral protein in a cell that is infected. So upon presentation of these peptides, this can elicit a T cell response with the CD8 T cell restricted to MHC class one and the CD4 T cell that is restricted to uh, class two epitope presented on MHC2 or HLA2 molecules. Now, in order for this T cell recognition to, to start, you need two ingredients. The first one is presentation of epitope on MHC, and the second one is TCR binding and TCR recognition. So in this talk, we'll be discussing a lot about presentation on MHC, and as I said, a little bit on, on TCR binding. So just as a, as a brief overview, we'll, we'll first talk about prediction of MHC1 ligands, then MHC2 ligands, then I'll introduce you to some of the recent work where we also tried to predict TCR recognition beyond presentation on MHC molecules. And of course, some of the key ingredients, if you do these predictions, is to collect good data and to have good machine learning tools. Now, in addition, something that is very close to my heart is also to try to interpret the data uh, from a structural point of view. And I, I'll show you examples of what we've learned about MHC binding modes, MHC ligand binding modes in, in, this, in this work. And then I'll conclude with a, a brief um, uh, vignette on the, the work that we've done on, on predicting TCR peptide MH interaction. This is still unpublished, so it will be it will be quite short. Okay, so let's start with the, the class one epitopes. Um, and to bring everybody on page, uh, some of you may know, but MHC class one molecule, which present this class one epitope for TCR recognition. Uh, by CD8 T cells, they are known to bind short peptides, so roughly 8 to 12 amino acids, and they require a specific amino acid at specific positions. And a very powerful way to describe this specificity is to use uh, binding motifs, which allow you to grasp very quickly the, what, what is specific. And often you see that the second and the last positions 
in the peptides are the most specific ones. So there's one that are more constrained in order for the peptides to bind to an MHC molecule. Another thing that is often overlooked in the, in the field of MHC is that it's not only about motif, but the length of the peptide has also lots of specificity. So many HLA molecules or MHC molecules, class one, they prefer nine mers, and then some have um, also, uh, they accommodate 10 mers, 11 mers, but at much lower frequency. Now, all these uh, aspects that come from sequence analysis can be understood from a structural point of view. If you look at crystal structures, this is the in gray, the binding site of the MHC class one, and in blue, you have a ligand, so a peptide. And what crystal structures have demonstrated is that the second and the last amino acid, they tend to point inside the binding site, which explains why they are so important for the binding and so specific. And the shape, and they, yeah, they fill this kind of pocket, which I would be an F pocket. And then the shape of the binding site also restricts the length of the peptide. So longer peptides, they need to bulge out a bit in the middle, but they cannot do this too much. And this explains also why we have a restriction in the length of the peptide. You cannot have very long peptide binding to MHC plus. Now, this specificity means also that only a subset of the peptides can be present it can bind to a given MHC uh, molecules. It's considered as roughly 0.1% of the peptides can bind. Now, a second aspect of MHC molecule that is very important is that they are more complex than one single protein. First, they encoded by three genes, the class one, and then this is the most polymorphic uh, locus of the entire human genome, which means we have tens of thousands of different alleles, so different proteins in the human population. And it turns out that different alleles have different binding motifs and different peptide length distribution. These are just a bunch of motifs for very common HLA allele. And you see that peptides that bind to HLA A0101 will not bind to HLA A0201, vice versa. And then those that bind to B0702, they need to have this proline, which is not present in the other allele. And you can also appreciate that, for instance, HLA A0101 accepts a lot of long peptide, 10, 11, 12 mers, while you have, for instance, C alleles that are extremely restricted to nine mers, almost entirely only nine mers um, to, that can bind to these alleles. Now, in, in facing this, this complexity of having many, many alleles, uh, we thought the best way to address and to, to collect motifs and peptide length distribution in order to, to understand the binding specificity of MHC molecule is to collect lots of data available. And uh, we got very much interested into the MHC peptidomics uh, data, um, partly because we, we had the chance to collaborate with Michal Bassani Sternberg, who is also here in Lausanne leading the immunopeptidomics platform and, and her group of research, <coughs> and who is one of the world experts in, in uh, MHC peptidomics. So, with this approach, what you do is you take a sample, could be cell lines or, or tissues, then you purify the MHC with a peptide, you elude the peptides and you run them through mass spectrometry. And in this way, you can get tens of thousands of peptides per samples. And if you start collecting many samples, it means we have hundreds of you know, millions even of MHC ligands. Now, one question, of course, if you have a real sample from, from a patient, for instance, is that they, patients express up to six HLA. So we have three genes, and then because of the polymorphism in the maternal and paternal chromosome, we have six different HLA molecules. And one question that back in, in when we started working on this was not solved is how can you infer from which HLA or which MHC molecules the different peptides come from? This is, of course, important because if you want to use this data to derive MHC motifs to train predictors, you need to be able to assign the peptides to specific MHC molecules. And the question we ask is, can we infer MHC1 binding motifs from these pools of ligands coming from multiple alleles? Now, we reason that this could actually be solved uh, in a totally unbiased and unsupervised way. <coughs> by taking advantage of the fact that some peptides will have similar sequences, and those that have similar sequences should actually come from the same MHC allele. So by doing some, intuitively, by doing some kind of clustering of the peptides, we could imagine that different clusters would correspond to different motifs, and that this could reveal the MHC, the motifs of the MHC allele in this sample. Now, in practice, cl doing clustering is not a great idea. There's a much faster and, and a more robust way is to use mixture models. This is just the, the, the equation that, that we wrote. And it's, it's a standard mixture model of multinomial distributions that can be optimized with the EM algorithm. 
uh, and we developed this algorithm published in 2016. Uh, and it works really well, and these are the motifs that you get in one sense. Now you may ask, okay, well, are these motifs correct first? Can we really trust that they are motifs of these HLA alleles? And the second question is that which motifs correspond to which allele? Because here we have say five motifs and five alleles because this, this cell line was monoallelic for the uh, HLA-A, uh, homozygous, I mean. But how can you infer which motifs goes to which allele? And for this, we actually developed a, an approach that takes advantage of the multiple samples we have. For instance, in this example, I'm taking two samples and you can appreciate that they share the HLA B37 allele, B3701. And what is remarkable is that they also share exactly one motif that is basic, I mean, indistinguishable almost. <clears throat> so this is a very powerful way to infer that this motif actually corresponds to B37 and also to make sure that this motif is robust and reproducible across samples. So now we've collected lots of data uh, about this, and we've done it at a, at a quite large scale. Uh, another validation is that we compare the, the motifs inferred from polyallelic uh, samples analyzed by motif deconvolution and the motif uh, found in monoallelic samples, and we see a striking uh, similarity for the cases where we have monoallelic samples. Uh, so this enabled us to actually derive accurate motif for more than 140 alleles and uh, almost 500,000 peptides by then pooling data across hundreds of studies. Of course, our interest was also to, to use this data to make predictions so that if you're given a peptide sequence, you can say, well, it's likely to be presented on a certain MHC allele. This is very useful in, in viral, uh, in infectious diseases, for instance, where you, you scan the, the proteome of a virus, or in cancer, when you take all peptides that contain a mutation and try to see which ones could be presented on the cell surface. So for this, we combine actually these position rate matrices together with the peptide length distribution. I'm not entering into detail. <clears throat> and then we, we, we eventually derive a percentile rank, which is somehow probability for peptide to bind to a certain MHC allele. And we did several benchmarking. And of course, when you do the benchmarking of your tool, you are better than, than everyone else. Uh, so this, this is, of course, something uh, we, we observed in our case. What made us quite happy is that this, this very good performance of the mixed MHC PRED tool was actually reproduced in, in other studies not done by ourselves. So these are just a few examples where mixed MHC PRED was working quite well. As I mentioned, we are also very much interested in uh, structural interpretation, so not only in machine learning and, and data collection. And I want to, emphasize, to, to yeah, exemplify this by one example, where we, we took actually um, uh, peptides from, from this allele, and, and I'm showing here the motif, and then we also plot the motif for the different length. And as you can appreciate, basically, you see the, the motif is, is elongating itself. And this makes sense because we know from crystal structures that the beginning and the end of these of the peptides on the MHC1 ligands are very well conserved in terms of specificity and they fill these binding pockets. And the middle part makes a bulge like this in the middle. However, when we looked carefully at our data, we also saw that there was a category of peptides that did not seem to fit the motif of the tenor. So we know that the specificity is for R, R and K, so uh, basic. Um, amino acids, uh, positively charged, but we saw a fraction of peptide that didn't have this positively charged residue at the last position. They had leucine instead, and actually they had the positively charged residue one amino acid before. And when we applied the motif deconvolution to the whole data set, much bigger than what I'm showing, we saw, saw that there was a sub motif here that seemed to correspond to the nightmare motif plus something which was really not expected for tenmers ligands. Most of the ligands were expected to, to bind like this. So we hypothesize actually that these peptides may bind in a different binding mode by actually following a nightmare standard binding mode and a C-terminal extension. So we validated this hypothesis first by doing some, some binding assays where we took peptides like this, we mutated the last position, which usually have a big impact on binding to HLA. And here we saw no difference when you change L to A. But when, then we mutated the second to last position, and then we saw that it was basically killing the binding. 
And then with the help of, of uh, Panagis Kile Pakopoulos, a collaborator from Oxford, we could uh, crystallize one of these ligands. And we saw that indeed, the, 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 the longer the tenmer peptide with this uh, anchor position at position nine was uh, overlapping very well with the standard nine mers that I'm showing in, here in blue. And then there was one additional amino acid here in the C terminus of the of the peptide that was um, filling a, a space in the MHC binding size that was created by this flip of the tyrosine 84. So clearly this was demonstrating that these peptides do bind in a C-terminal extension mode uh, and not as a bulge um, in, in the MHC binding site. And we could also show that such peptides can be recognized by T-cells. So this, this C-terminal extensions are absolutely compatible with T-cell recognition. So just to summarize this first part, I've shown you how motif decomposition could identify um, almost 500,000 MHC1 ligands. From, from this mass spec data, uh, immunopeptidomics. I show, I've shown you how we could take this data to define MHC1 binding for more than 100 alleles, binding motifs. I've shown you how we can improve predictions of MHC ligands with mixed MHC PRED. And now, of course, many other uh, studies have used this approach and, and incorporated uh, immunopeptidomics data in the training set of, of the, the predictor. And finally, I've shown you how we can get insight into non-canonical binding modes. In this case, it was C-terminal extensions. Okay. Now I've mentioned that I want, I mean, we're also very much interested in class two epitopes. Uh, the reason is that we know they are very important. Uh, we know that CD4 T cell recognition is, is crucial for starting and also for modulating immune responses against pathogen and cancer. And class two epitopes have been slightly less uh, studied than class one, partly because the predictions were less uh, accurate for them in the past. So for class two, there's a, a bit of an additional challenge. And uh, uh, because class two also, class two MHC molecules, MHC2 molecules bind peptides with this kind of motifs, but the motif is not the whole peptide, it's actually flanking, resi flanking regions on both sides of the motif, at the N and C terminus here, the, that, that extend. And this is because the, the binding side of the MHC2 molecule is much more open than the binding side of MHC class one. And, and therefore it leaves space for extensions on both sides. So the C-terminal extensions are very common in the class two. This was known from previous study. So basically you have peptides that look like this. You have some terminal regions that have some specificity, and then you have the binding core, which reveals the specificity of an MHC2 alpha. And peptides binding to MHC class two also have length distribution, often peaked at 15 mers, but some can take longer peptides or shorter peptides. And then the binding core is often in the middle of the peptide. That's also something that people often forget uh, when they, they work with MHC class two is that there's a clear preference for the binding core to be in the middle of the peptides and not close to one of the termini. And again, same story as for class one, MHC class two uh, alleles are encoded by multiple genes. I mean, six genes to make the story, story sim simple, and they are uh, highly polymorphic. We have also uh, almost 10,000 different alleles in the human population. And then they make pairs, actually. There's an alpha and a beta chain. And of course, polymorphism for the DP and the DQ, for instance, can be found in both the alpha and the beta chain, which means that uh, the combinatorial makes it even higher uh, number of, of different uh, uh, complexes than, than for the class one. And as expected, different alleles have different motifs. So some alleles, for instance, they like to bind this kind of peptides. Other alleles bind this kind of peptides with this motif. So completely different motifs. It's really a lot of variability. So here again, we set out to, to use mass spec data, immunopeptidomics data uh, for class two alleles. Now we had a bit of a challenge here. We could not run the motif decomposition uh, simply on this data because these peptides, we don't know where the binding core is. Um, and, and it can be at a different position, although it has a preference for being in the middle. We don't know a priori where this binding core is. But a very smart uh, postdoc, now a senior scientist in the lab, designed a, a powerful approach to, to search actually for motif everywhere. And basically in words, this is how it works that you, you basically search for motifs and the, then the model little by little learns multiple motifs and converges to some solution. 
Now, of course, if you do it with four peptides, it doesn't work. If you have 4,000 peptides, it will work. And this is just a mathematical description of the model. It can be thought of as a, as a convolutional neural networks where each uh, motif is actually a filter that you apply on your data and you learn different filters that can be visualized as motifs. And again, if you have multiple data set, you can appreciate that for instance, these two samples, they shared one of the GRB1 allele and they have exactly one shared motif and so on. For instance, these two, they share DP allele and you have a conserved motif and so on and so forth. So we did exactly the same approach of you know, collecting all our data, finding groups of samples that share exactly one allele, getting the motif that is conserved across these samples and annotating to the, to the respective allele. And this enables us to connect actually a quite unique collection of MHC2 binding motifs for 88 alleles, uh, more than 600,000 peptides across 364 samples. We think these data are very useful because the MHC2 binding motifs were much less well uh, characterized before this work. Um, then we also integrated the, all these data into a prediction tool, which is called MixMHC2PRED. Not, I mean, without entering into all the details, we, we take the sequence of the binding side of MHC to allele, then we predict what motif it will have. And then based on these motifs, together with other properties, we score a peptide that is given as input to the model in order to predict whether a given peptide could bind to one of these MHC2 alleles. And we benchmarked our tool. And here again, we were in general better than state of the art models like NetMHC Tupan, MHC Nuggets, and Maria, that were other tools that were published uh, in, in previous publications. Uh, we always observe that MixMHC to Pred is, is giving very good performance. We also prospectively apply these tools to cancer epitopes, because this is of high interest in, in, uh, in our institute. And, and we could validate quite a, a few predictions and, and show that in general, mixmhc 2 pred was better at, at finding net predictions than the comp main competitor, which is an atmhc 2 pump. Here's another example of a, of a neoantigen where mixmhc 2 pred could identify the binding, re the region responsible for the, for the presentation while netmhc 2 pump was not successful in this case. Then we ask also, even that we have so many alleles, we will never be able to collect data for all these alleles. So can we use our tools to predict motifs that uh, have not been characterized uh, in, in, with experimental data or for alleles that have not been characterized with, that we do, don't know any ligand? Uh, so for instance, here we, we took some, some alleles like these ones and we, we removed them from the training set. We did a leave one allele out cross validation. And this is the res results of the prediction of mixmhc 2 pred So we were very pleased to see that actually it can capture even relatively mild specificities at different position, while this was not the case for, for other tools. We also tried to do these predictions across different species. And here again, the, the model was actually quite good at uh, predicting the motifs, even when we were removing all the data from this allele uh, when making these predictions. Next, we, we, we sat and we thought of it that, you know, we've always assumed that the peptides binding to class two molecule bind in a conserved orientation. Basically, there's the N terminus here and the C terminus. And this assumption is prevalent in, in pretty much all crystal structures. And it's also the basis of all prediction tools. So people always take prediction tools, whether they are motifs or neural networks, and they start from the N terminus and try to predict if a motif is found somewhere in the sequence going from N to C terminus based on these motifs. <laughs> However, we actually observed that several alleles, all coming from the DP genes, when we, we go a bit fi more fine grain in the, in the motif deconvolution, they seem to show uh, a multiple specificities that you can see here for each allele. So two different specificities. And that, these specificities had the remarkable property of, of being the symmetric image of each other. So clearly, for instance, if I take this allele, <laughs> what the multiple specificity, specificity tells us is that several peptides need to have K and R in the beginning of the binding core and E and D in the last position, but a few other peptides seem to have the opposite pattern. They have E and D in the beginning and K at the last position. And then based on this prevalent symmetry of, of the multiple motifs, we hypothesize that this may actually be peptides that bind in the reverse orientation. So we, we, we again took um, 
took efforts to do crystal structures. This was done in Florence Poget, EPFL, so, so the, the crystallography platform, and, and with a lot of, lots of I mean, trouble. If ever you do crystallography, I think you know that this is not a, a simple game. But eventually, we managed to get some, some good crystal structures. This is a crystal structure of a peptides that bind in the forward direction. So the N terminus is there, the C terminus is there. And then you have this anchor position here and there that correspond exactly to the motif. So this is the expected one. Then we took a peptide that was predicted to bind in the reverse orientation and we managed to crystallize it. And we observed that in this case, the peptide indeed was uh, in, the, in the reverse orientation on the binding side. The C terminus was here, the N terminus was there, and the pockets were filled then by the N terminal anchor and the C terminal anchor. So this was a clear demonstration that peptides can bind actually in the reverse orientation on, M on some MHC class two molecules, especially the HLA-DP adults. And then we could also then use this reverse mod binding motif to scan the proteome of different uh, viruses and, and take some, uh, some uh, predictions and we could demonstrate that uh, T cells can actually recognize these peptides that bind in the reverse orientation. Uh, so this, this reverse binding mode is perfectly compatible with TCR, CD4 T cell recognition. So to summarize this second part, I've shown you how, again, motif deconvolution now uh, adapted but to, to consider multiple uh, position of the motif could identify lots of MHC2 ligands, how could actually define uh, MHC2 binding motifs very accurately and improve predictions of MHC2 ligands, and how this unsupervised approach of motif deconvolution together with some structural insights could actually reveal the, these non-canonical binding modes. In this case, this was the reverse binding peptides on uh, MHC2 molecules. And this is, I think, quite quite elegant approach to really just um, interrogate lots of sequence data and try to interpret them from a structural point of view, uh, giving us unique insight that were difficult to obtain also because if you were just to test blindly peptides in the reverse orientation, most often you don't select the right allele, so you don't select the right peptide. Okay, some shameful advertisement. If you're interested in MHC motifs, we've also built this, this web resource, MHC Motif Atlas, where we provide lots of information about different MHC allele, the standard motifs, motifs for different lengths, peptide length distribution, multiple specificities, motif for phosphorylated peptide, and then you have a chance to, to discuss them here, but we also collected lots of phosphorylated peptides uh, to, that bind to, to different MHC alleles. Now, of course, we know that presentation on MHC molecule is one uh, side of the equation, but T cell recognition is not only about presentation. There are plenty of cases where we know the antigen is presented, but for some reason, it is not or not well recognized by T cells. So we asked a bit, how can we bring TCR recognition propensity? And the first approach was to do it in a TCR sequence agnostic way. So we're not looking at TCR sequences. We're just looking at properties that enhance the TCR recognition propensity of these of, of specific epitopes and hopefully independent from the binding to HLA molecules. So again, we, we design a model, uh, a machine learning model that basically takes multiple uh, input nodes. One input node is the binding affinity to the HLA because we know this is something very important for TCR recognition. And then we have a second set of input nodes that capture um, the amino acid frequencies at positions that are in the middle of the epitopes because we know from crystal structures that these uh, positions are very important for the binding of the TCR and much less important for the binding to the MHC. Uh, and we also took advantage of our motifs to carefully select these positions so that they don't include uh, residues that are important for the binding to the MHC. Then we collected neoepitopes in this case, <clears throat> lots of positive neoepitopes and also lots of negative, so, so negative peptide that did not elicit um, uh, TCR recognition. And we train our model, and this is a cross validation analysis, for instance. Uh, the model is called Prime 2.0. We already had the second version. And we saw improvement in neoantigen predictions in these cross validation studies. Now, because we focused on this residue in the middle of the epitope and we had a model that was fairly interpretable, we could also ask what are the amino acids there that favor TCR recognition? And this is if you put the coefficient of a regression, of a logistic regression, 
Mm, and what we've served and that was quite striking and really give us hope that we are not totally in uh, shooting in the blue uh, is that the, the ordering of the amino acid on this so-called immunogenicity scale mapped, matched very precisely the biophysical properties of amino acids. So the most immunogenic amino acid were tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, which are all aromatic, then the hydrophobic ones. And then on the other side of the scale, we had the positively or negatively charged. And this makes some sense because if you have hydrophobic residue, we know anything that is hydrophobic will be more prone to, to interactions because of the, uh, the less favorable interaction it makes with, with the solvent. Now we did several validation. This was on some stimulation of, of a naive CD80 cell from donor. And we saw that on average, not always, but on average, the, the amino acids that were predicted to have the highest hydrophobicity were those eliciting the, the most uh, the strongest T cell responses. We also did some vaccination immunization, immunization in mice with a, I mean, a limited number of peptides where we mutated the amino acid in the middle at position five. And here again, we saw that tryptophan and phenylalanine led to stronger immune recognition than, for instance, lysine, where there was no, no response. And then by doing crystal structure, either new crystal structures with Brent Baker or also analysis of existing one, we saw that several of these hydrophobic amino acid or, or aromatic amino acid did indeed face in the TCR, uh, towards the TCR and made several interactions with the amino acid in the TCR in those cases where we had crystal structures. So this also confirmed the, 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 the ability of this amino acid to engage into interactions, molecular interaction with the TCR. Finally, we applied our tools to, to SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. Many people have been working, of course, on SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and uh, we, we just scanned uh, the, these, these SARS-CoV-2 proteins and predicted uh, some, some epitopes. And then we, we had quite um, some success in validating uh, several predictions. This is an example of, of validation in PBMC samples. And I want to draw your attention to one example here where we even could detect a, a clear response in effector uh, CD8 T cells, so suggesting that this this response was not due to you know stimulation that we've, we've done in this interferon gamma Alice spot and then sorting experiment, but was really something happening in the patient where these T cells were were taken from. And this is an example of a beautiful a beautiful example of an epitope that has really I mean a cluster uh, or hotspot of of aromatic residue with these two tryptophan, tyrosine, and an isoleucine here that uh, <clears throat> is likely to explain why this this T, this epitope uh, elicited such a good T cell recognition. Now there is still one question that puzzled us: is that these samples were collected in um, April two thousand and twenty, so just after the onset of the COVID nineteen epitopes. And uh, the donors for which we had collected this sample had never been tested positive, had, had never had any symptoms. So most likely at this time, you know, less than 5% of the Swiss population, for instance, had been infected by COVID. So it was very likely that these people were, this, this donor was actually COVID negative. And we still saw a strong response in the CD80 cell, the effect of CD80 cell. So we ask whether this response could be due to actually cross-reactivity with other common coronaviruses that most of us have, most of us have been exposed to. And we actually tested these other coronaviruses with a specific clone. And actually these T-cells, what, what I forgot to tell you is that also they, they all had the same TCR sequences, basically 99% of them had exactly the same TCR sequences. So it was really a monoclonal response. So we took these clones, we expressed them in jerkat cells, and then we tested with the, homo, the homologous peptides in different coronaviruses. And what is remarkable is that this hotspot WPW and Y is extremely well conserved across different uh, strains of the coronaviruses. And all of these epitopes could actually be recognized by this entity. So we believe this is an example of a <coughs> response that was there uh, um, uh, due to other coronaviruses, uh, but could actually maybe even uh, protect a bit against the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, epitope. So there was a clear evidence of cross reactivity against um, across different coronaviruses. Okay, so to summarize this, this prime algorithm, I've shown you how we could integrate TCR recognition propensity into the, the, the our epitope prediction pipeline. Uh, I've shown you a direct relationship between amino acid properties 
and immunogenicity, and also some validation in TCR peptide MHC structures where we can understand what's the role of this different aromatic residue in the middle of the epitopes. And then eventually this led to, to improved prediction of immunogenicity. Still, I want to emphasize that when we predict this immunogenicity, we have this <laughs> immunogenicity uh, propensity, but we also have the HLA binding. And still, by far, the most important and specific factor is binding to HLA. And then on top of this, we can help a bit by adding the immunogenicity predictions. Okay, so in the, in the last five minutes, I want to briefly discuss some, some recent work that we've done. <clears throat> and then the, the motivation is that so far, I've discussed how we can predict uh, presentation on MHC molecule. I've discussed how we can also capture some signal of TCR recognition, but still we never included the, the TCR sequence and we are totally blind to which TCR could bind a given epitope. Uh, so we were interested in moving into this, this field of, of also predicting actually TCR peptide MHC interactions. And this is the work of a very smart postdoc, Giancarlo Croce, who is uh, now wrapping up his, his, his manuscript and, and we hope to, to have it uh, in a few months on bioarchive, and he actually engaged into a, a, first a data collection because we believe, I mean, collecting good data is key for all machine learning approaches. So he's been using several databases of, of TCR epitope, TCR peptide image interactions, but he also made the effort to, to go into, <clears throat> into recent publications and, and data that were not necessarily included or not curated in those databases and really did uh, quite a lot of work to, to collect uh, a high quality data set. So in total, for instance, if we take epitopes with more than 10 TCR recognizing them, we have data for 146 epitopes and, and in total, uh, something like 17,000 uh, different alpha, beta TCRs interacting with 146 peptide images. And we focus on alpha, beta TCR because we, we think, and this has been actually shown in many previous studies, that uh, both the alpha and the beta chain can be uh, very important. For, for TCR, um, for predicting what which uh, TCR recognize a given epitope. And then uh, what we did is to train a model called TCR PRED, where we, we start from alpha beta uh, chains of, of TCR, we, we consider the CDR1, 2, and 3 loops, then there's an embedding layer, transformer encoder, and then a, a standard uh, multiple layer uh, neural networks in order to predict uh, whether a T cell recognizes a specific epitopes. I should say, so this is an epitope specific predictor, which means that we train a separate model for different epitopes. In this way, our model cannot generalize to any epitope, but this is something we've shown uh, quite extensively that this generalization currently does not work for an unrelated epitope. So we don't think anybody in the world can make predictions for an epitope unless this epitope or an extremely similar epitope is in the training set of the tool. So what we did first is five-fold cross-validation, so internal cross-validation. And what we observe is that, well, for, for epitopes with lots of TCR, the predictions are actually uh, not so bad and even quite good for most of them. But for epitopes with a limited number of TCR, then we run, of course, into, into issues. And some, some epitopes have good predictions, but some have a totally random predictions. So we believe uh, we need something like at least 50 TCRs to make to build a model of the, the, kind of the motifs of, of which uh, properties TCRs that recognize a given epitope have. And then we also benchmark with different tools. This is for class one and for class two epitopes because we have both class one and class two. And we observed that we're actually better than the existing tools. I mean, and sometimes the performance, the difference are not enormous. For instance, TCR DIST in this, in this uh, benchmark performed very well, but was actually limited to only five epitopes where we had something like 15 different class one epitopes. Uh, then we also use some of you may know this IMRAP benchmarking uh, framework that was published last year, where, where many people came together and decided, okay, let's let's build a data set that could be used as a like uh, independent benchmark <coughs> that that people can use to check their model. And here again, we were better than most existing tools uh, on on all the epitopes that were supported by the, our tools and, and different tools. So I mean, we have done some other applications which I, I don't necessarily have time to to discuss here, but I just want to summarize that we, we collected this, this large data set of TCR peptide image interactions, including some, some curation of, of recent data um, to, to expand the epitope coverage. 
Then we train a machine learning TCR peptide MHC interaction predictor that we, we call TCR PRED. And then we've shown that we can have actually reliable predictions for uh, epitopes which have more than 50 TCR roughly. That's the, the way we, the, the threshold. I mean, this can be discussed. Some people claim 100 TCR, some other 50, um, which means that we can make predictions for roughly 40 different epitopes. And, and of course, we are very much interested in expanding this, this kind of tool. So we are now working with several collaborators here in Lausanne to, to profile TCRs binding to multiple epitopes, either taking data from, from uh, standard uh, you know, PBMC from donors. We have also some, some phage display project to screen a very, very large number of, of TCRs and, and binding to specific epitopes. Uh, hopefully more will come soon uh, from my with this, I would like to acknowledge, I mean, first the, the, the organizers of this of this uh, meeting, and then several people from the lab. Julien Rach is a brilliant uh, postdoc, now, now senior scientist. He did all the work on the MHC class two. Uh, Giancarlo Croce did the work on, on the, the TCR peptide MHC and TCR PRED uh, tool. Daniel Tarros and Marte Soledé also worked on the, on the MHC class one. Um, uh, ligands, identification and predictions. And we had several collaborators, Michal Bassani Sternberg for the immunopeptomics, Alexandra Hari for all the T cell assays and the validation, George Kukos, um, Panakis for the crystal structures, Brian Baker and Florence Poger also for crystal structures. And of course, I'm, I'm, thank, I'm thanking you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, do we have some questions? Time. Um, I, I, I had, <laughs> for me, and, and also for Ellen's work, you go across species, and, and I hate to <clears throat> show my lack of knowledge of MHC, but I mean, for instance, Classically, in humans, you've got three uh, uh, genes for MHC1. Uh, I mean, if you go to non-human primates, if you go to mice, is that similar? Does it completely change? And how does that change your predictions? And Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, that's actually something we're working on now. We, we, um, I mean, we still have uh, need a few months. We, we've tried to explore how far you can extend these predictions. Um, and then the, the story is pretty clear, and that, that's good, actually, that's good news. Uh, within human alleles, for both class one and class two, uh, it seems the predictions can be extended very well. So we've really left this time when, you know, people said, oh, rare alleles, we cannot make predictions, <clears throat> HLA-C allele predictions are impossible, HLA-DQ predictions are so bad. We think this has really changed with this new data, and within human alleles, both for class one and class two, we can quite accurately predict the motifs and predict the ligands. Because the prediction of immunogenic epitope is still more challenging, but in terms of predicting the ligands, uh, they, this works very well. And they are <clears throat> basically, we've covered the sequence space of all possible MHC motifs in human. Now, the story is different if you go away. Uh, if you go to primates, you can still make predictions, but not fantastic. And then if you go much away, even in, in mouse, if you take away all your data from, from, from the mouse and you try to learn the motif only from a human, you will fail. You still have an AUC that is better than random when you benchmark <laughs> tools, but this is because, uh, for instance, the, the length distribution is a bit conserved across species. So still MHC motif in mouse, they tend to prefer nine mouse. So this gives you some predictability but still it's very far from good predictions. And if you check the motifs that are predicted, they, they end up being quite wrong. There's also a bit of conservation that the last amino acid in class one, for instance, is generally hydrophobic. So this, you can somehow extend these predictions, but if you look at the motif, they are quite flat with a little preference at the ninth, at the last position, which means you don't capture the MHC motif. You capture some global properties of MHC ligands, but not enough to make predictions. So, um, the, um, I mean, clearly the going to, to other species, and I'm not talking about zebrafish or, or this kind of species, uh, mm -hmm. is challenging. And this is due because of the, in addition to be polygenic and polymorphic, the MHC molecules uh, evolve very fast. So they're quite different across species. So I see Jamie has a question. 
Yeah, thank you. That was a great uh, talk. I have a question um, about uh, the selection process uh, where, um, you know, in the, um, in the thymus uh, during T cell development, you have uh, positive and negative selection going on on MHC molecules that uh, controls, uh, you know, what a uh, C, what what T cells are going to be CD4, and what T cells are CD8 positive. And I'm wondering, uh, do you have any way of understanding what elements of the MHC molecule itself um, T cell receptors are recognizing, or or any thoughts about how you might uh, might um, how you might figure that out? Yeah, that's a that's an important question. Um, of course, these positive and negative selection are very important because we want to exclude T cell that binds, or we want to exclude T cells that completely misfolded, TCR misfolded, and then will be totally inefficient. So that's some of the positive selection. We want to make sure they still can recognize, can engage very weakly with some peptide MHC. And then in parallel, we want to avoid T cells that have this massive um, uh, or this very risky uh, recognition of self epitopes. I believe that uh, the, the elements are those that, that are selected in the, in the positive selection phase are the residue of the MHC and some peptides in the middle that, that face the standard canonical binding modes of TCRs. So those that are on top of the binding site. Uh, I think these are the most important elements. Now, a big question is what would be the footprint of the HLA molecules in TCR repertoires? Uh, we haven't seen much, uh, we haven't worked much on this, and, and it, it is actually not a simple uh, thing. Uh, it's been very difficult to find, as far as I understand, to, to predict MHC, more, MHC allele from TCR repertoires. Um, and I think that's because the positive selection requires very weak binding, and, and this will apply to all MHC allele. In my, that, that's one explanation. Right. If 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 it, if it were possible, you may be able to take a, for instance, a T cell repertoire, and be able to understand or predict which MHC molecules they were selected on uh, by virtue of their CDR uh, sequences and combinations. That's that's why I was asking about that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I've never seen. Um studies that really demonstrating that you can predict the HLA typing from the TCR repertoire. The, there are some evidence maybe that you know, some specific clones tend to occur more in donors that are E2 positive or something like this, but it's not so, so easy, I think. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's really hard, but you guys are doing such a great job. I thought you might have some ideas about, about no, how, we, to, we how to pull that few, off. Yeah, we did a few attempts, uh, not, not pursuing much. We never, we were not successful. But um, well, again, which is not that we explored extensively the field. No. You know, it's really the noise of avidity that's killing everyone, right? I think I think so. Yeah. 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 So, so we have a question from Anastas. Anastas. Hello, Anastas. Hello. Uh, Hello, Anastas. Very interesting Thank talk. You. Thank you. Um, it, my question is uh, more a remark, uh, as if it is not. Uh, complicated enough, I want to complicate a little more. Uh, have you thought of uh, presentation of uh, glycopeptides, which, uh, uh, why I thought of that, when you show this most uh, immunogenic uh, uh, residues, they are actually residues which are preferred in peptide minotopes of carbohydrates. And okay. uh, Previously, there were papers, even from our group in the States, uh, which uh, show that uh, it is structurally you can overlay uh, a peptide with uh, tryptophan in the middle with uh, a, a peptide with attached uh, uh, monoride saccharide. Mm -hmm. And tryptophan is a very good uh, mimic of that thing. So once I saw this, I, I thought maybe you could think also of this, making it even more complicated. 
Yes, this is something uh, we didn't look at. So to be honest, the only post-translation modification we looked at is phosphorylation. Um, the glycosylation scared us a bit because it's, you know, you have so many uh, possibilities that uh, you need to take some care when you, you look in mass spec data to find glycosylated peptide because uh, uh, <laughs> you need to be careful to, to force discovery and these kind of things. So we didn't look in, in, um, in glycosylation, but I'm sure this could be very, very interesting and we may discover that many MHC ligands are actually glycosylated and that lead to specific T cell recognition. This I absolutely agree. Oh. There's also a bit of a crazy hypothesis with the tryptophan. There's some work from uh, Samuel uh, uh, Yardena Samuels in Israel at, at the Weizmann that show that uh, sometimes tryptophan uh, uh, are, are modified into phenylalanine and phenylalanine um, and vice versa. So it, it could be another thing that actually some of the, the tryptophan ended up uh, eliciting uh, some of, yeah, there were some modifications. Uh, so they actually created some neo antigens. But I don't know to what extent how prevalent this is, but there are some hypotheses uh, about this. Yeah. But we didn't look into glycosylated MHC ligands. This would be very interesting. I mean, I'd love to do a, a global survey of all post translational modification in MHC ligands. There's been work done on, on the, the, <laughs> some other modification like diogenase or something like this. Thank you. I was wondering, um, throughout your talk, I was wondering about public resources for these MHC and the ligands. And, you know, you mentioned 400, you, like for your first study, you had a million ligands you discovered. And then at the end, you mentioned the website that your group, I, I guess, is running as, um, is there kind of a central group that helps coordinate these resources? Because then for the last study, you talked about, well, you had to combine, you know, you had to combine IADB and BDJDB and all these, and presumably you had to like worry about redundant studies. And, you know, these are all the, a lot of the questions that the air community is, is struggling with. I was wondering what the MHC type community is doing for similar organization and yeah, so in terms of MHC ligands and epitopes, IEDB is certainly doing a very good job. Um, they've, they've collected lots of uh, different studies. Now, one limitation is that uh, many of um, the immunopeptidomic studies, we don't know a priori what the HLA restriction is because we have up to six LEs for the class one functions. So they've, they've been careful in IEDB to indicate that this peptides can bind to one of six HLA alleles or bind to MHC class one, but we don't know why. So that's the reason why we, for the MHC class one, we actually went always back to the original studies. There's no compilation of databases. Mm -hmm. uh, and every study has been uh, run through the motif evolution. This is very mm -hmm. useful to find allelic restriction. It's also useful to, to pinpoint cases of contamination. I didn't want to discuss too much about this, but for, this is for the class two, we easily have 5% of the peptides that are completely unspecific. We believe they are contaminations actually. Um, so we've cleaned all the data and then all our results, they are in our MHC motif atlas. So we think at this in terms of MHC motifs and MHC ligon, this is a very useful resource. Um, um, some of these data are also in IEDB, and IEDB has, of course, much uh, many other data set, uh, many information about immunogenicity, for instance, which we don't provide in the MHC motif atlas. Uh, but if you're interested in motifs and, and characterizing these different MHC alleles, the MHC motif atlas is, in my view, a very good uh, resource, which is you know, nice also, even if you're you know, playing with some epitopes and checking T cells that bind to it, have an idea of whether it fits the, the motif of the HLA or not. And then for the, for the last part, it's true that we compile data from many databases and we, we were careful to avoid redundancy across these databases um, for the TCR epitope extraction. And one is the BDG database, but it turns out that it's good also to look at other resources. Great. Well, thanks again for a great talk. Why don't we take a few minute break and we'll start with Ellen at the top of the hour. <laughs> 